Hello and welcome once again, and probably the last time, to Christ the Healer. Oh, how I've enjoyed this course. We are finishing up talking about some natural laws that we that we ignore, sometimes we don't have knowledge of, or we just go against those natural laws of God. And, and that's many times the reasons we get sick in the first place. So while we can believe for God to heal us, if we're going to stay healthy and not presume upon His grace and His nature, then we are going to continue to learn how to stay healthy in the first place and what even causes disease in the body. The Journal of the American Medical Association included an article by Barbara Starfield, MD, stating that, this is not me, this is her saying, physician error, medication error, and adverse events from drugs or surgery kill 225,400 people per year. That makes our healthcare system the third leading cause of death in the United States only behind cancer and heart disease. Don't misunderstand me, my friend. I go to doctors. I'm not telling you not to go. In fact, I've probably had too much trust over the years. I came from a family that says you don't question authority and anything they've told me, I've never even gotten a second opinion for, never looked up, but I'm changing some of that. I believe that God uses doctors. I believe that there are many good ones out there. There are some, like any profession, that are in it for the money, don't really care. There are some that are better than others, more qualified than others, more knowledgeable, dig a little. And you have to ask God to help you find the right one. And when you take their report and, and when you, you don't go, or do, that's, again, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm just trying to give you some stats that have been a, a surprise to me. So we don't put, we never should have put our whole faith in the medical system anyway. It needs to be in God first and foremost. But there are a whole lot of things that they aren't trained in in nutrition that they don't even know probably as much as about as some of us lay people who've been studying a lot about it. So there's a whole lot you and I aren't going to know unless we dig some things out for ourselves by the help of the Holy Ghost. Now, we have the choice to make between optimal health and the banana split. I was trying to decide how I wanted to put that, and I decided that would be a humorous attention-getting sentence because they are mutually exclusive. You cannot have both. I know me. I want health, but I want the Big Mac. I want health, but I want the banana split or the pecan mudslide. <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking of right now. But they are mutually exclusive. I'm not saying a person can't have on occasion a banana split or occasion a Big Mac. I'm not saying any of those. I'm talking about what we have made our God and what we have lived on for convenience, for, for time, for money, because we're addicted to the chemicals that are in there that purposely addict us to those foods because our taste buds have gotten used to them. Lots of reasons. But we've got to make the choice that supports our more important desire. It has to be our fundamental top priority. No more instant gratification. The process of creating health takes time. We have to take control of our daily choices of today's unhealthy lifestyle, and it is doable. It's interesting how much the medical field has changed. When I watched, I believe it was when I was watching the video Forks Over Knives. May have been one of the other ones, but I'm pretty sure it was that. It was so interesting to me that they showed some commercials from the early 60s, might even have been the late 50s, that showed physicians in their white coats sitting in a hospital smoking a cigarette. And it said, this, I, I think it was Camel, but I'm not sure which brand. This is the cigarette most preferred by physicians. This one is easy on the lungs. This one is, and I'm looking at that going, are you kidding me? Everybody was watching that in the United States. And I thought, you have got to be kidding. Then they showed another one where they were showing, instead of breast milk, it's been, sh and, and it's showing the lady taking the baby off the breast. That shocked me first in a commercial back then. And it showed them saying how, how supplements were better. Now, today we go, did anybody ever believe that? Do you know, hopefully that's going to happen if we're still around 10, 20 years from now where they're going to be showing old commercials. Do you know when I've been at the doctor's office, the medical magazines laying on the tables many times have the commercials on them for the fast food places. You know why? There are lobbyists in the, 
AMA and, and all of our food industry and all of our governmental agencies and all of the nutritional panels. I have read so much about that lately. These, these people that will not tell the truth or allow others to, or they will blackball them if they do, because they are supported by these other industries. It used to be that some of the doctors were being supported by the tobacco industry. Now that's unheard of, I hope. <laughs> but now we've got the same thing going on in nutrition. It's interesting that at first we were told by the authorities that what we eat has nothing to do with our physical well-being. Now, finally, they're starting to reverse some of that and finally advise that a change in our diets will help reduce the risk of cancer and heart attacks. In the China study, I did not write all this down, so I can't give you the specifics. You can read it for yourself. But our, our governmental agencies that make up the food pyramids and put the dietary advice on, on school uh, menus and all of this, they met some of these agencies and they recommend that we have the most outlandish protein amount. They actually increased it instead of decreasing it. And they gave some sample menus where you could actually eat a bunch of potato chips, have some ice cream. Uh, Dr. Campbell, that was the scientist whose name I could not think of in the last session, he was the one talking about this, how he made a sample menu, menu that would fit in with their regulations, and it was the most atrocious food. And he called up some of his colleagues on this panel, saying, what were you guys thinking to raise the protein levels and stuff? And everyone he talked to said, I didn't know they put that in there. When we met, everybody was arguing about it, and we just left and did. You're kidding. They put that in there, and they signed my name to it, that this is what I recommend? Interesting. <laughs> So now they're just starting to say, there's some things that might reduce your cancer and heart attack rates, but they're coming up with their own report saying, we study, there's no correlation between breast cancer and fat. There's no, all of this is a bunch of bunk. There are plenty of studies that have been done that show all of this. Now, Christians put little thought into what we put into our bodies. Part of that is due in faith in the food industry, believing they would not produce or market a product that could be harmful. If you knew what they were doing to most of the fruits and vegetables, let's forget about how they're grown and the preservatives and all that junk. If you saw what they did in the supermarket, how they radiate those to keep them looking as red as the apple did a week ago to keep them, you wouldn't even believe it. That's why it's so important. And I, I know I ran into a, a fellow Christian in the supermarket a few weeks ago that said to me, Ah, I wouldn't buy organic. I saw a study that that's all a farce and that they've got the same chemicals on that. Do I think that there's some people that slip through the ranks and there's some of that going on? Absolutely. We aren't in a perfect world. But do I believe there's natural organic farms that are really trying to do their best? Are they a little more expensive? Yes. But, but it's a, remarkable to me how many more, as we make a demand for those things, how many more of our just regular food stores, not even nutrition food stores or natural food stores, but just regular ones I've been able to get organic at that, that isn't that much more, especially when the things are on sale. Sometimes they're not even as much as the regular. But we've just believed that people won't lie to us. Um, but, but there are government agencies set up... <laughs> that we think they're there to protect us. And actually we're being fed many times, not with all of them, but sometimes with a lot of lies. We've got to get educated. We've got to do something about all this. We've got to start preaching it, living it by example. That's what I'm trying to do here, folks. I've done the teaching, I've done the preaching, and now it's time I start living it by example. And you can hold me accountable. Because as I said, in a few months, I'm going to come back on and show you the before after and give you my before cholesterol, my after cholesterol, and some of these other measurements. I have learned that the same nutrition that prevents disease in its early stages before a diagnosis, here's the good news, can also halt or reverse the disease in its later stages after diagnosis. Sometimes we think, Oh, well, it's too late now. Wish I would have heard all this when I was a kid or a teenager. Now look how long I've put these poisons in me. It's not too late. I have seen the before and after of people in stage four cancer that just juiced and ate fruits and vegetables and it completely left them. Again, I'm not telling you to do something apart from your doctor's instruction. I'm telling you to seek God and look into some of this. Um, I saw that that cancer that was already initiated and growing in experimental animals was slowed, halted, and even totally reversed by good nutrition. 
An ounce of prevention, as we've heard all of our lives, really does equal a pound of cure. And the earlier in life that good foods are eaten, the better one's health will be. I love watching these little children, our, our great-grandchildren now, are eating uh, fruits and vegetables. And um, I know um, our little great-grandson, Owen, he, he loves to eat all these salads. I just stare. I didn't even offer them to my children at that age because we were told kids won't eat salad. And we were too dumb to, to try it and seek God about it. So, of course, that's better. But we can start at any age we're at. Now, I'm going to give you an example of how we need to change things and why I'm taking this time to talk about what some people would call, well, this is secular. You're no longer giving your Bible. First of all, we did. We talked about the body being the temple of the Holy Ghost and how we are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that is Bible, my friend. But I want to show you some things about how we used to think and how God raised up teachers, thank God, to begin to reverse that. For years, Christians sat by, just sat by, and allowed a secular, humanistic educational system to remove God, remove the Bible, remove prayer, remove teachings of morality from our classrooms of our public schools while teaching that man came from a monkey. And we sat back and went, well, that's all we can do. That's the school system. And we're just supposed to talk in church. We're not supposed to change that. We have done that in politics to the extent that we almost have uni no United States of America. We've all said, well, we're ministers. We're not politicians. And we better keep them se separate. And so we have let the ungodly take over the nation. Finally, especially when it came to education, the Christian community was outraged. Thank God. And they finally began to do something about it. And so we had a Christian school uh, movement that began and peaked in the 70s. Now, just like that again, we've got too many Christians for too many years sitting by idly, idly, while the world has taken over our, our nutrition, our healing profession, uh, regulating what goes in our temples. When, when the Bible tells us our bodies are God's, they aren't the world system. They aren't the medical fields uh, temple. They aren't what somebody else is doing out there. They belong to God. And we thought, well, that's the unspiritual part. We'll just do what everybody else is doing out there. We have left it all to a profession that many times are in direct opposition to God's ways. I'm not saying always, but many times. Oh, you feel a little nervous today? Start taking a drug. Don't tell you about the repercussions that are going to come down the line because of that drug. Oh, can't sleep? Take a drug. Oh, now you can't wake up? Take a drug. Oh, now you don't want to control what goes into your body? Take a drug to block the fat. Oh, now, now take one to, to give you diarrhea. Now take one to do... Instead of turning to God, can you help me? Is there another way to do these things? We've allowed our body to be drugged by chemicals, to be burned, to be mutilated. And when the patient doesn't get well or dies, we accept it and say, well, we did all we could. And then we call it the will of God. My goodness. Hippocrates, the great physician, taught that food must be taken in the condition in which it was found in nature. All those years ago. Uh, the man that we call the father of medicine, like the first doctor, he said it needs to be as close to nature as possible, uncooked. And then he said this, your food shall be your medicine and your medicine shall be your food. Wow. It seems as though he knew more than we do all of these years of all this education and all these machines and all these drugs and all these implants and bypasses and we come back to finding out what he said all along. I don't care how much you study, you're going to find out that food needs to be your medicine and your medicine needs to be your food. We can start to take steps right now to improve our own health, change our thinking, question whether our present diet and lifestyle will produce sickness or superior health. It's not easy to change lifelong thought patterns. We must re-educate ourselves. Knowledge is necessary in order to make intelligent changes. I've started educating myself. It's never too old or you're never too old or it's never too late to start doing that. Better now than never. Stop accepting as gospel all that the so-called experts are telling us. Remember, if there was no sickness, the experts would be out of business. 
Do you think all of those people want you totally well where you never have to visit a doctor? You never have to take a drug? You think that's what the drug companies want? Hey, I've learned how to be well all the time. I don't need any of your expensive drugs. No, my friend, that's not what everybody wants. We've got to teach this not only to our children, we, we've got to teach it in the churches because it's spiritual, because we are a three-part body. And I, I, I mean a three-part being. Some of us are a three-part body. <laughs> That's why we've got to change that. <laughs> but it's funny how we'll just talk about the spiritual stuff. But if I don't have a body, I'm no good to you spiritually. I won't be here to teach you anything else that the Word of God has to say. So it's very spiritual. We've got to teach it in our churches, in our Sunday schools, how to take care of God's temple. The biblical approach and how to take care of the body. We've got to change laws about how food is governed, nutrition standards, especially in our schools. We've got to learn to eat organically. Some people need to learn to grow their own food. And I know that's not possible for all of us in our lifestyles, but some people may pray and consider it. We've got to share our knowledge and our enthusiasm concerning the proper care of the body with family, friends, and neighbors. The food being consumed and the lifestyle that is being followed are slowly destroying the health and vitality of our great nation, including the Christians right along with the non-Christians. It makes me think of the verse where the Bible says that God reigns on the just and the unjust. These foods are destroying the saved and the unsaved. Our lack of exercise is destroying the saved and the unsaved. Not taking care of ourselves or even giving it a thought is destroying us just like it's destroying the world. Various forms of sickness and disease are consuming a larger and larger part of our energy, our time, our money, and our emotions. Let's face it. I notice that what can get me more frazzled, frustrated, whatever, quicker than anything is when I don't feel good. Is that not the same with you? There are things you want to do, want to enjoy, but how can you, how can you feel happy about it when you can't even move and you don't feel like getting from one chair to the next and there's nothing about it that's going to be fun when the joints hurt to walk or whatever else is going on. Why has all of this happened? Because simply we have been on the wrong road concerning health, nutrition, and the proper care of the body. The Bible says very plain and simple, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Of course that's talking about salvation. But it's also talking about God's best in any area of our life. There's only a few that find it because it's easier to travel the other road. But we don't have to keep traveling that road. We must refuse to destroy our bodies any longer by refusing to partake of these habits, these foods. Old ways must become new ways. Oh, that reminds me of another verse. Old things passed away. All things becoming new. We need that in regard to our diet and lifestyle. I guess we need a born again lifestyle change. Now, I've mentioned some, mo uh, some movies, some books earlier before I started talking about all of this. And I want to just mention some quickly again, some that have blessed me. And I'm sure there are many more and we can share those things back and forth. Please write us, let us know about some more that you think would bless us. The Hallelujah Diet. Why Christians Get Sick, both of those by Dr. George Melkmus, The China Study by Dr. Campbell, the scientist I had mentioned earlier, Dr. A's Habits of Health, that can be found in, in, uh, in, on, online if you look up Take Shape for Life or you look up Metafast products. Um, now, Elijah said this, uh, he came to all the people and he said in 1 Kings 18, 21, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. Oh, it's so easy to halt between two opinions. I'm sure that I have a lot of you sitting out there right now going, Oh, Debbie, this makes sense. This is my new beginning. I want to do it. And as soon as you think that, you go after one more chocolate long john with cream in it. I've been there. I know what you're thinking and saying. There are some others that probably go, I don't like this at all. I didn't mind your spiritual teaching, but this is making you mad because you don't want to give up any of that. 
I've been there too. <laughs> and there are more people that are just, boy, I can see it, but I don't know. And it would take a whole lifestyle change. There comes a time we have to go, God, you're either big enough and you can either grace me to do this or not. I'm not going to be of two opinions. Now, I started out this series giving a little bit about my own testimony. I'm going to just add a little bit more to this as we wrap this up. I came from, uh, from a family that all of the people in the family, all of them, mother and father, but especially the women. My mother, I think, weighed in her 90s when she got married at 18. I think she only weighs about 101 right now. She's a little too thin right now. I have a sister who just turned 40 this year. There's, there's a, a big gap between us. And she thought, sure, when she turned 40, she could break 100 because she can't get above 100 pounds. And yes, she lives on a lot of junk food and, and things as well as good food. But I, I've seen her eat the shakes and everything and can't uh, drink the shakes and eat the burgers and not break 100 pounds. That's the family I came from. So in high school, I was just like them. I was one of the smallest in my class. I was the envy of my friends. We would go to McDonald's and they'd say, better give Debbie our fries. We all have to watch our weight. Look at her. She never even has to think about it. So number one, I never learned how to be disciplined because I never thought I'd have to be. Nobody in my family had to be. My parents ate a lot of fried fruit, food. They had both grown up on farms and uh, everything was well done. And, and they never were big eaters. I never saw them eat a whole lot, but every night there had to be, as my mother would say, a little sliver of dessert. She'd bake a pie or cake and everybody would have a little bit before going to bed. We always had the big family things around food every holiday. Every, we had lots of people to our house and it, it was just big. Food was big business in our family and all fellowship was around it. And we never had anybody fat in our family. We never even thought of any association with that. So I never had to learn to be disciplined. Plus, I was very, very involved in athletics. I was a shortstop in softball all through junior high and high school and loved it and was good at it. I was on the drill team. I was a cheerleader. I was in the middle of playing with the boys in the neighborhood football, basketball, before we had girls basketball in school. And so I was also very involved in those kind of things. Then eventually, due to a lot of factors, some I've shared in, in other uh aspects of the ministry and testimonies, but through a whole series of events, I became involved in lifting weights. But it's so my personality that if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it all the way. So I ended up competing, not in bodybuilding, but in powerlifting, which you do three lifts, the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift. Now, to be my best at that, I knew I wanted to stay in my weight class. By then, I had three children. I was 35 years old. Still, in a size four, which I thought was gigantic since I had always been in zeros and ones and then eventually crept up to three. And I thought people had doubled. I had no, no mercy on people. When my friends were in tens in high school and twelves, I thought if I was ever in a double digit, I would just put myself in a closet and never go out in public. That, that's the way I was. Shame on me. And uh, I had no patience for people who were overweight. I thought if they just control themselves while I'm eating my fast food and don't even have to worry about it. Then when I became involved in weightlifting, I started jogging to help stay in that weight class. I didn't want to weigh over 114. If I weighed 115, I would have to go in the next weight class of 123. So I then I had to start watching it for the first time. But between all my jogging, my weightlifting, I still didn't eat real careful. Stayed right at 114. Had 12 trophies. Ended up being a gym instructor at Rama, And people envied me. They'd see me once in a while having an ice cream bar or a cone and they'd say, look at her. How can she eat like that? And they'd be at the salad bar, but they weren't doing all the heavy lifting and running I was doing. Not only that, I taught strength to a football team. They went to state that year. Very, I didn't think I could look like this if I sat around and ate like a sumo wrestler 24 hours a day. <laughs> Little did I know that when I went through some tough things emotionally, and some of you know the other parts of my testimony, and people who were very controlling in my life were gone, I thought, oh, I don't have to worry about having the perfect body, the per and I can enjoy whatever I want to enjoy. And right about then, I'm in full-time ministry. To go from working out all day long for a living and competing 
to sitting around talking with ministers over big dinners, living in airports, living in hotels, no time to work out, two meetings a day, one big meal late at night, at midnight or one o'clock in the morning, steaks and burgers. It didn't take long for my body to go, who is this person? And once the metabolism got messed up, then I became lethargic and didn't feel like working out if I would have had time. And then I started not feel good. Let's have a fast Coke to try to feel better, to just go to the next meeting. And, and I could tell you about all the other things that contributed. But then when the body starts messing up, it starts becoming very efficient at lowering the metabolism and packing on fat cells at a faster and faster rate. And the more you do fad diets and gain and lose it and gain and lose it, all of that contributes to that. Now, then I started making those fast food rendezvous my comfort in tough situations and lots of pressure. And the next thing I knew I had on 100 pounds from the way I used to live. I never had any patience for people who could gain 25 pounds in their life, let alone 100. I now see how it happens to people and the discouragement that sets in and the embarrassment and the lack of self-esteem, even when you know what the word says, and even though God's doing great things through your life and your ministry. And that is all bad enough. But then when the health begins to go, when you know that healing belongs to you and you know what the word says, but every time you go to believe, there's that conviction there. And then on top of the conviction, your own condemnation of you let yourself get like this. You can't believe God. You know the junk you're eating. You're not, it is time to change. I wish I would have at 35. I wish I would have at 40. I wish I would have at 45 the first time people were handing me those tapes I talked to you about. I wish I would have at 50. I wish two years ago when I lost 50 pounds, I would have stayed with it and had all 100 off. But today, right now, in this nice pink chair is where I'm at. And today, wherever you are is where you're at. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for resurrection. Thank God for repentance. Thank God for restoration. Thank God for knowledge. Thank God that this isn't the end of the story. And I am open enough and honest enough and vulnerable enough to let my story be on here to help you, my friend. We will do it together and we will learn to live in divine health, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, spirit, soul, and body. Lord, we yield to you. Help us in Jesus' name.